All right, so um, we conceived this panel um, as a sort of, uh, uh, many of us are doing interdisciplinary work at Purdue. Um, two of us are in the philosophy and uh, literature program. Uh, Jessica's in philosophy and communication. And uh, Max, uh, our Maxwell Spears here. I'm going to go up in a second, it's fine. Is in the uh, philosophy department, but is very much interested in the sort of um, ways that philosophy gets uh, picked up and treated in other areas. Um, so. What we want to do is sort of point to that interdisciplinarity um, in each of our, our panel presentations. And what we're going to do is each of us will take about 15 to 20 minutes to present our work. And then we'll have a short uh, period where you can ask uh, questions to each one of the panelists. Please, if you can, keep these questions short and try to ask more sort of like clarificatory questions, questions directly related to their particular paper. Um, we'll have a little uh, less time, maybe five to 10 minutes to do that. And then at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes for a sort of general discussion about uh, the panel. And at that time, you can ask whatever questions you want to directed toward the panel as a whole or toward um, any one of us. Um, so with that, um, I'll introduce uh, Jessica Sturgis, um, Remainders and Rejoinders, uh, Communication as Embodied Testimony. All right, thank you. Um, this paper begins with an insight borrowed from Deleuze and Gattari. In their collaborative work, What is Philosophy? They define philosophy in distinction from science or the arts as a discipline which creates concepts. Concepts are not ready-made objects waiting around for someone to put them to use, but creations made in response to a particular problem. The problem I wish to explore today I draw from Mary Ponty, namely the insufficiency of theories of communication offered by either the traditions of empiricism or intellectualism as he outlines them in his phenomenology of perception. As we recall from Mary Ponty's typology, for the empiricist, communication is a process of transmission and reception, the exchange of information. The person desiring to communicate, although somehow the force of desire remains unaccounted for, calls together discrete bits of meaning that are somehow converted into audible sound, the mechanism of the voice that is then spoken to a listener who, with the receiving mechanism of the ear, receives bits of sound and process the, processes them into an intelligible meaning. The culling together of words for speech is the mere trace of consciousness stimulated by an external source. Quote, the given stimuli call the word up in accordance with the laws of neurological mechanics or those of association. End quote. Moreover, the word is but a psychic, physiological, or even physical phenomenon set alongside others and thrown up by the work, working of an objective causality. Where misunderstandings to occur is due to a breakdown in the speaking and listening mechanisms, or perhaps a physiological glitch that called up the wrong word. The intellectualist, on the other hand, understands the word as only, quote, the external sign of an internal recognition that makes no contribution to the recognition itself. Speaking becomes nothing more than an articulation, or as Mary Ponty puts it, an external accompaniment to thought. Consequently, intellectualism encounters a problem in how the speaker a private consciousness is able to come together, that is, commune with other people. In other words, there's a pressing dilemma of solipsism. To attend to this problem of communication and the tensions between empiricism and intellectualism for Gaila Ponty, I suggest an alternate concept, that of testimony. Concepts sometimes draw their names from new words. However, in this case, I turn to a long-held word both in religious and legal discourse reoriented toward different purposes. I'll use testimony to mark the experience of trying to speak in the midst of the impossibility of doing so. I'll say more on this later. Concepts, too, are not solitary travelers and are often found in dialogue with other proximal concepts. In this respect, to address the concept of testimony from a phenomenological perspective, I must first attend to two neighboring concepts, that of the body and the horizon. These two phenomenological explorations will, I am hopeful, offer a keen space for examining the problem of communication. A phenomenological style of thinking holds open a hope for describing our experiences of the world as they are actually experienced and not as they are conceived by the discourses of science. Indeed, I intend to suggest here that the explanations of communication given now by scientific thought broadly, what we might call objective thought, fail to accord with our actually lived experience and thus leave the core of who we are most profoundly misunderstood. Phenomenological thinking and its practice of the epoche, or the bracketing of the natural world, that is the objective rendering of experience, allows for insight into the primordial workings of human being in the world. 
Insight into the role the body plays in being in the world, I argue, assists us in understanding the practice of communication as well. Furthermore, in an effort to show the body is always already permanently textured, I shall turn at the very end of my talk to the thinking of Gadamer to enrich Mary Luponti's articulation of horizon, a term at the center of who we are and how we understand ourselves. Let us first turn then to the, uh, the first complementary concept, the body. As we know, the body for Mary Luponti is not merely an assemblage of tissue and organs and nerves, the anatomical configuration known as the human form. That body is nothing more than a corpse. Nor is the body the extension of matter with which the thinking mind must unfortunately deal. That body is nothing more than a cage. Rather, the body is that living manifestation of being in the world, our commitment to the world as the site through which we engage in meaningful projects. Mary Ponty states, quote, the body is the vehicle of being in the world, and having a body is, for a living creature, to be inter-involved in a definite environment, to identify oneself with certain projects, and be continually committed to them. Echoing Heidegger, we see that it is the body and not consciousness that is engaged in the world. Our bodies and the world are imbued with intentionality and overflowing with meaning. This becomes clearer when we turn to the phenomena of perception. When I perceive an object, Mary Lou Ponty writes, quote, one phenomenon releases another not by means of some objective efficient cause, but by the meaning which holds it out. There is a reason for the thing which guides the flow of phenomena without being explicitly laid down in any one of them." End quote. Said differently in perceiving, there is a motivating phenomenon and a, and a motivated phenomenon. For example, in viewing my friend down the street, the interposed objects between she and I, for example, trees, signposts of parked vehicles, serve as a motivating phenomenon that shape my understanding and offer a pattern for the motivated phenomenon of my perceiving her as small that is, as far away. At the level of perception of my body understanding itself within a world, there's an unarticulated understanding of the phenomena I witness without the aid of formal reason. Perceptual phenomena are given to us as integral wholes, suffused with meaning, not as a series of sense units nor a collection of innate ideas to be pieced together. Our bodies become what Mary Ponty terms the pivot of the world. We are the hinge or the space at which the world opens up as meaningful. The world in constant communication then with our bodies shows itself as a collection of possibilities wherein our bodies can take up a particular task. Our bodies and the world are laden with possibility. Possibilities are always possibilities of something against the backdrop of other potential actions. To clarify the showing forth of world and perception, Mary Ponty draws from Gestalt psychology in order to sketch an understanding of the world and perception that resonates with our actually lived experience. For Gestalt psychology, perception in its most basic state involves a figure against a background. Either without the other, either without the other makes perception impossible. Quote, the perceptual something is always in the middle of something else. It always forms part of the field. It's from within this field that something can be brought into relief and made meaningful. This brings us to our second complementary concept, the horizon. Experience from Mary Ponty and phenomenology in general takes place within a horizon of meaning. Like the horizon in a painting that frames the action in the foreground, the horizon of meaning gives boundary to our experience and understanding. There is no body without horizon. Although he reminds us that experience and perception are always against the background of a horizon, there's little sustained conversation in Mary Lou Ponty of what a horizon means for experience and any possibilities such an understanding might disclose. He states early in Phenomenology of Perception that looking at an object is, quote, to plunge oneself into it, and that, quote, the horizon is what guarantees the identity of the object through the exploration. In perception, we inhabit that which we perceive. Our bodies and the objects melt together in a mutual project. The horizon guarantees the identity of the object because it is always an object that shows itself against a particular background, a particular understanding of the world that, excuse me, a particular understanding of the world that brings the object into perception. When the object ceases to be at the forefront of attention and no longer stands in relief, it falls back into the larger world horizon, not in an act of disappearance, but of merging with the greater horizon of possibilities. 
For example, when I drink a cup of tea at my desk, I perceive the coffee, or, well, I drank tea, but I perceive coffee. When I drink a cup of coffee <laughs> at my desk, I perceive the cup of coffee before me as the backdrop of a crowded and paper strewn table. And it is from this background that I can perceive my cup of coffee and the meaning that it holds for me. However, this horizon can be continually expanded like a series of nesting dolls. Merleau Ponty furthers this thought, making explicit his understanding of experience as a subject object dialogue. Quote, the body is no longer conceived as an object of the world, but as our means of communication with it. For the world no longer conceived as a collection of determinate objects, but as the horizon latent in all our experience and itself ever present and anterior to every determining thought. End quote. The world shows forth as a horizon of possibility. The myriad potentials our bodies can take up and live out in meaningful ways. The particular things within the world horizon present themselves as invitations for undertaking particular projects. They solicit us and they have their say. Against the background of the broader horizon, the things of the world come forth as incomplete patterns of meaning to be, com to be completed through an interaction with the body. By conceptualizing the body as a means of communication, that is, as the site at which meaning is made, Mary Ponty makes space for understanding the body and its horizons as hermetically textured. Our bodies and the things of the world are already caught up in understanding, and our bodies tend towards things understanding them. The very constitution and meaning of our bodies is such that we are our horizons. Our bodies are hermetically textured with the inscriptions of our various horizons and sedimented meanings that we carry with us wherever we go. Against this background of two complementary concepts, the body and the horizon, what I wish to offer in closing are a few preliminary thoughts for understanding communicative practices as instantiations of testimony, a term I'm hopeful highlights the role of horizons in our communicative situatedness. A horizon of any given situation is ever-changing and moving with the current of lived experience. Because of the dynamism of horizons, a horizon is ever and always an incomplete unity tenuously held forth as complete for only but a moment, only to fall back again into the flux of experience and finitude. Mary Ponty makes clear, quote, the synthesis of horizons is no more than a presumptive synthesis. For a moment, the horizons of those in conversation fuse and understanding is achieved. However, such understanding is temporary and recedes into the larger horizon with the additional unfolding of possibilities. Horizons by their very nature, always withdraw despite our persistent attempts to reach them. Consequently, every communicative act is provisional and no final word is to be had. With the primacy of horizons for experience and for understanding, the impossibility of communication is brought into relief just as clearly as its possibility. Indeed, communication occurs all the time and all around us, and yet it is impossible if we understand it within the confines of intellectualism and empiricism. If we assume communication to be the mere transference of information held by one consciousness and somehow conveyed to another, which it isn't, then communication is from the start always already unable to occur. Under these circumstances, as Mary Ponty so eloquently puts it, the existence of other people is an outrage for objective thought. For phenomenological thought, however, other people are not an outrage, but a gift an opportunity for the achievement of the fusions of horizons in a given situation. However, communication is impossible in a more life-affirming manner as well. When we dwell together in the world and we communicate with one another, we speak what I like to think are impossible words. With the withdrawing of every horizon into the greater world horizon, all attempts at closure are precluded. As a presumptive synth synthesis and not a given completion, our communicative practices are always open to refiguring and renegotiation. Consequently, our communicative practices are imbued from the start with a strange humility. The humility, that what might, the humility that whatever might be said is never all that can be said, even and perhaps especially when we've said too much. The communicative event is unable to be enclosed within a particular context and always has, as a part of its structure, a remainder. The remainder is the remainder is what was not said, perhaps what could not be said, within the particular attempt at sharing an experience. Moreover, the experience, as it is necessarily mediated in order to become intelligible, always loses something in the process. 
only the recuperation of which would make communication as the transference of information possible. There is within all communication something left undone, untouched, uncommunicable, preventing the complete and direct sharing of an experience. Like Penelope's weavings, for those of you who like Homer, communication undoes itself for the sake that it might be undertaken once more. The remainder of the unsaid is something to which we can only appeal and never confirm. It has force and consequence only in its withdrawal and absence. Communicative practices are able to break with and enter into new contexts. What is said and the experience of presence can never collapse into sameness. With the creation of new contexts, that is, the creation of new responses, relations, and practices, what is being said infinitely differs from experience. We are left then with the task of rethinking how we think about communication and in search of a new vocabulary. Religious discourse, whatever problems it may hold, and I do believe it holds problems, is one of the few remaining spaces for thinking outside of the logic of calculation and exchange. The language of religion has a tradition of speaking about the impossible and the wonderful, of a present shared in common but unable to be articulated in full. In the face of that which cannot be articulated, we testify. That is, we speak humbly words that can never clothe the unspeakable in full. We testify in the presence of transcendence, whether vertical or horizontal. It is my position here that every communicative practice, from the most mundane, for example, could you please hold the door, to the most extraordinary, I love you, carries with it, because spoken within a larger world horizon, a dimension of transcendence. The grander horizon transcends its participants and is the condition for the possibility of their coming together in a conversation. Communication as testimony liberates us from the calculated worlds of the empiricist and the intellectualist and opens us to the communicative possibility of being otherwise. In highlighting the provisionality of every communicative act, it keeps the, commu it keeps the communicative disclosure of further possibilities open rather than foreclosed by assumptions of the complete transference of information. When we testify, we are aware that something else can always be said. In this sense, testimony forefronts freedom, the freedom of an ever-expanding horizon of possibilities that can be taken up and spoken in particular circumstances. Moreover, this freedom is always understood and embodied as caught up in the mutual interplay of the body, others, and the world. Every other stands forth as a gift and not merely the threat of pain, a gift of the possibility of shared world disclosure, a gift for the overflowing of meaning and movement of both horizons. Few minutes for uh, questions directed to and Jessica. You can deal with your own. Um,
components, that there is a, the, a, a strict distinction. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I think about it for Mary Lou Ponty, but I do think that there it, that you can experience speech, but as soon as you try to talk about it, you run into the same problem of not being able to encapsulate it in full. But I don't think that's a problem in the negative sense. I think that's something that we perhaps ought to cherish. Right? That's the great thing about language is that we can't ever say everything. Right? That would be total closure and awful and violent in some res in many respects. So I don't. I don't think I want those two to, to conflate into one, one another. I'm not sure if that addresses your question, but I'm not also sure how to address it without utilizing the reading that you're talking about. No, I think, I think that does that does clarify. I mean, okay. it would seem to, I mean, it seems like a basic uh, presupposition of all time you, you have to have that distinction. Uh, yeah, so. In the back. Mm -hmm.
Um, but now I, I'd like to introduce uh, John Fong and uh, his paper, Eco-Phenomenology, Literature, and Environmental Ethics. Thanks, um, so the, the sort of trinity of phenomenology, literature, and the environment is historically a point, perhaps nowhere so immediately as the title of Martin Heidegger's lecture, Poetically Man Dwells. Uh, this phrase, taken of course from the line of Butterley, <coughs> reads, full of merit, yet poetically, man dwells on this earth. Asks us to think of man's being as dwelling on earth and poetry as a letting dwell of this being. Dwelling poetically is a taking measure that cares for the earth. We could even go so far as to say that Heidegger prefigures the politics of sustainability when he quotes from Sophocles, for kindness it is that ever calls forth kindness. Still speaking, <coughs> historically, we can take a step back in time and across the Atlantic to Henry David Thoreau's masterpiece, Walden, long considered a foundational text for American political nature writing, and later uh, deeply analyzed by Jupiter criticism. Walden should also be understood as part of a parallel development of phenomenology, although published half a century before Bruce Earl developed the idea of the epochase, the phenomenological bracketing of non-essential qualities to get to the heart of an experience. It's, um, I think it's how we should read Thoreau's most famous passage, right? He says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, skip ahead, to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. I think that's prefiguring the, the epoch. So phenomenology has always been concerned with nature or the world or the environment and all the polyvalent ways that those terms are deployed. Much more recently, we started to extend this theoretical concern to the practical concerns of environmental activism, most explicitly in the 2003 uh, movement defining volume titled Eco Phenomenology Back to the Earth Itself, edited by Ted Todvine and Charles Brown. So, as a movement, eco phenomenology separates itself from classical phenomenology because rather than merely being broadly critical of the mind world divide or naturalism um, or something of that sort, it, it adds a specific ethical task to motivate that critique for solving 21st century environmental crises. But rather than talk abstractly about historical movements and competing philosophical systems, I'm going to offer you uh, my attempts to think through a particular problem of environmental ethics. Um, so I'm going to do like an applied sort of thing here rather than theoretical. And I specifically want to keep in mind a statement from Erasmus Kohak um, in his Ecophenomenology essay. He says, the move from empirical ways of knowing to phenomenology is in part a shift from the naivete of approaching reality as a set of space-time objects and causal relations to approaching it as a system of interlocking roles. And here's my problem. Uh, I'm going to give some examples here. Uh, last November, during a hunting trip with my dad, I casually brought up an ongoing legal debate over high-fence deer hunting in Indiana, in Indiana. If you don't know what high-fence hunting is, it's this weird system where you, people are breeding deers in enclosed spaces, so they're not part of the public herds. People come in and shoot them, like pay to shoot, uh, and they call it hunting. <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the Department of Natural Resources claims that canned hunting businesses are illegal because all wildlife is common property of the people of Indiana, it's in a public trust. However, there are several of these private hunting preserves operating around the state while the legal and legislative issues are playing out. To my surprise, my dad's opinion is that if those deer were bought and raised separately from the state game herds, then they are private property and the owners could do with them whatever they want. Even though the idea of trophy hunting in general, and can hunting in particular, goes against what my family values as the essence of hunting, which is hunting for food and with respect for life. The trump card for my dad, to my amazement, uh, is that there's this doctrine of private property. That's what matters. So to approach this problem in an eco-phenomenological way, I will offer three competing ontological accounts of the human-deer relationship. And by ontological here, I simply mean that the being of the things we encounter in the world, and therefore our own being, is revealed by the way in which we encounter them. And that might not be super rigorous, but it's something I can use um, going through life. Like, it's an easy uh, shorthand. Additionally, to have a respect for life, as applied to non-human animals, I'm trying to encourage a comportment toward the animal that is not radically limited as merely an object in a causal use-based network. Ontological respect for life would mean allowing that thing, the animal, to come into being alongside ourselves 
in a relationship that is not foreclosed or overdetermined. Um, so uh, adding to this sort of phenomenology, uh, I want to add uh, Iris Marion Young's concept of social justice. Uh, she says, uh, quote, I suggest that social justice means the elimination of institutionalized domination and oppression. Any aspect of social organization and practice relevant to domination and oppression is in principle subject to evaluation by ideas of justice, end quote. Um, so institu institutionalized domination and oppression is what I want to key in on there. So now we're trying to accept the apparent paradox of hunting, the competing claims of trying to kill an animal whose freedom you say you celebrate. I find a way out of this paradox or a kind of argument that my dad has used many times, but that I never quite agreed with. When talking to anti-hunters who happily eat meat from the grocery store, my dad would say something like, well, at least the deer I shot today had a chance, whereas the pig you're eating was bred and born and was to be killed. Uh, I still don't like the phrase, they had a chance. I think it resonates with attitude and complacency around all kinds of institutional oppression, uh, where one success story is trotted out to deny that such oppression exists. However, in the context of relationships between humans and animals in general, it had a chance, expresses a value system that places less determined interspecies relationships at a higher priority than overdetermined interspecies relationships. To speak ontologically, an intensive feedlot domesticated pig is a kind of thing without possibilities. While a white-tailed deer in the field and forest of the Midwest is a kind of thing whose possibilities both interpenetrate the possibilities of humans and exceed those human relationships, uh, even when we're hunting them. In the interest of interspecies social justice, then, we have a duty to encourage the kinds of relationships hunters have with deer and discourage the kind of relationships consumers have with factory farm meat. So here's my three uh, phenomenological descriptions. Uh, one, last fall, uh, my family, on our way home from the pumpkin patch, past a freshly killed deer mangled in a heap on the side of the road. A few dozen yards farther down the road was a car on the shoulder, shattered windshield, and front quarter pedal bashed in. In the car, uh, still in the car, sat a man talking on his cell phone and waving his arms around. Uh, I could clearly imagine his conversation to a 911 or his spouse, whoever he was calling, you know, I don't know what happened. It just jumped in front of me. Or to use the language of Paul Virilio, uh, one of my Ponte students, the dead deer is what crops up. For Virilio, our perceptions and experiences are flattened by the speed of modern life, so that we encounter the world as if looking through a car windshield, which at high weight speeds becomes a flat screen in which things crop up. Lost is all depth perception and peripheral vision. All we have is speed, the flat screen, self in the world, and the accident. Uh, example number two. Seeing that shattered deer and shattered car the shattered perceptual field of the driver. I thought back to a recent experience I had deer hunting. Uh, walking into the woods before dark, finding my spot against a down tree at the edge of the clearing, sitting quietly while the woods slowly came awake with the pre bomb light, thinking about how the slope of land should funnel deer into the clearing just opposite where I'm sitting. Every so often, moving my hand down super slowly before another shot of coffee from a the thermos, the movements and sounds of the woods jumping directly uh, into my immediate and reflective consciousness almost simultaneously. And then amazingly, a deer appearing right where I expected her to. Uh, in, in a sense, both of these first two descriptions have the same objective outcome, the violent death of a deer. The second deer, however, became nourishment for my family that winter, and the eating of that food reverberated with the experience of that slow, cold morning in the woods. I'm not just claiming that this example exhibits a better use value of an object, uh, in the name of safe sustainability or something like that, uh, but that the being of the thing, in this case a deer, changes based on the relationship. And also the being of the humans involved is radically different, even from, we can speculate, perspective of the deer. As hazards, perhaps, the hunter-human and the motorist-human occupy different niches in the fabric of the deer world. Uh, and now I want to add a third possible phenomenology of deer. This from an Indianapolis Star newspaper report on canned hunting. This passage describes a video made at one of the deer farms, uh, and it was available for a time to watch on YouTube. Uh, the video opens with five men wrestling a white-tailed buck into a metal chute. The deer's eyeballs bulge as the animal crashes in pure terror. 
One man crams a cup-like device wrapped in duct tape over the buck's mouth and nose is connected to a tube pumping tranquilizer gas. They wrap a pink blanket over the buck's eyes. Its thrashing slowly subsides. One of the men gets to work on the deer's hindquarters. He inserts a probe into the deer's anus and places a camouflage-covered bag with a funnel attachment over the deer's genitals. He gradually turns a knob on a yellow box. The deer's back legs shake as a probe of electric current causes the deer to ejaculate into the funnel. After collecting the semen, the men saw the animal's antlers for safety in the pen. Sorry. So beyond the sadistic electrosexual violation of this buck, which is an atrocity on, um, we might say, the ontic level, I want to call your attention to the instrument, instrumentalization of life itself, which is an ontological violence. The buck with desirable characteristics is reduced to the use value of those genetic traits, which are isolated, physically and metaphorically wrenched from his body to be reassembled into a product fit to be sold in a one-to-one -one market exchange. Often these clients at these hunting ranches um, pick out a specific buck, kill them, and then pay based on like rack size measurement or something. So it's just a regular exchange, not a market exchange. Some of the animals bred in this manner are simply grotesque, with racks many times larger than the average wild animal would produce, so that they stagger under the weight of this bizarre, scientifically produced fetish. Um, so when talking about institutionalized domination and oppression, uh, Young's phrase, we should not consider if there's a magnitude of evil in the domination, not only of individuals, but of species and of kinds. An objectivist perspective may insist that we are still talking about white-tailed deer, but my phenomenology tells us that the interspecies relationship, constitutive of the concept of deer, has, has been corrupted into something with no similarity, either to our hunting or our road hazard experiences. So with these three examples, I've tried to show how a phenomenological method reveals three kinds of things that are all uncritically called deer. The road hazard revealed through technological speed is what crops up in the accidental, a hunted being that is encountered through lived experience and which then sustains other life as food, and uh, a fully overcoated object of scientific rationality tailored to the fetish market. This meditation that I'm calling a phenomenology all came out of trying to work through my bad surprising acceptance and hunting preserves based on an ideology of private property rights. But the key to this whole project was also inspired by the following passage from William Faulkner's novel, Go Down Moses. Uh, this is a literature part of the whole literature of phenomenology. Yeah, environmentalism. Uh, to summarize a bit, if you don't know the novel, in this scene, uh, Isaac renounces his claim to his birthright, the McCaslin plantation with its violent history of plantation life. Slavery, rape, decisionation, incest, all these Faulknerian themes, a history that is metaphysically tied to the enclosure of wild land by black colonists. In this passage, Ikimatubi is a Chickasaw chief who sold the land to the white people. So, quote, uh, Isaac talking to his cousin. I can't repudiate it. It was never mine to repudiate. It was never fathers and uncle buddies to bequeath me to repudiate. Because it was never grandfathers to bequeath them to bequeath me to repudiate. Because it was never old Ikimatubi's to sell the grandfather for bequeathment and repudiation. Because it was never Ikimatubi's father's fathers to bequeath Ikimatubi to sell the grandfather or any man. Because on the instant when Ikimatubi discovered, realized that he could sell it for money, on that instant it ceased ever to have been his forever, father to father to father, and the man who bought it instant when he realized he could sell it for money, it ceased ever to have been his forever, uh, father to father. The temporal and ontological slipperiness of Faulkner's language illuminates what is at stake in the shifting interspecies relationships I've been talking about. Or to return to Heidegger's language, maybe Faulkner's poetry provides the measure of man and his dwelling under the Godhead. In the same way that the land which would become the McCaslin plantation changes nature instantly across generations and temporalities by being captured by the technology of exchange value. If we allow the pay-to-shoot killing of genetically dominated and charted animals to be called hunting, then the nature of hunting, the nature of deer, this particular possibility of procuring food from the commons of public trust rather than our commodity supermarkets, 
is lost not only for our own and future generations, but for past understandings of religion as well. The ontological violence extends both directions in time. Okay, so I, I chose this example of DR for my eco-phenomenological demonstration in part uh, because it opens up some of the challenges of the method. For one, there are probably some of you, or maybe a lot of you, who think I'm guilty of the worst kind of anthropocentrism, a common charge against phenomenology and much environmental thought. After all, in, in all of my examples, the human world relationships, the animal is either killed or tortured, and I can offer only an explanation for what that violence means for the human participant in the relationship. In Heidegger's infamous formulation, the animal is world poor, right? But, but even if we believe this, it certainly does not follow that there being world poor relieves us of an ethical commitment toward them. Ted Toadvine, the, the editor of Eco Phenomenology, goes farther and says, quote, nor can Heidegger's insistence on a radical distinction between human and animal be dismissed as a consequence of the peculiarities of his own interpretation of phenomenology. Rather, the animal-human distinction goes to the heart not only of the phenomenological method, but of philosophy itself. Todd goes on to say that thinking through this relation of humans with other animals and with nature in general goes to the heart of the problem which has traditionally been expressed as a contrast between life and spirit. Um, I also chose this example because it's hard and it like, has consequences. I think a lot of things in phenomenology are very trivial things. Um, but, but the other difference Perhaps my example confronts is one of scale and political action. The practical difficulty of promoting diverse micro resistances, micro resistance solutions to a world that is engulfed by fatalities. We all know, for example, that pursuing monoculture based global commodity market food paradigms is a mistake for many reasons ecological, ethical, economical, and otherwise. Despite this, when I talk about hunting as a way of sidestepping the dominant capitalist paradigm of food distribution, I often hear the accusation of well, there's not enough deer for every one of the lot of them. Similarly, when talking about farmers markets or backyard gardens, we hear the criticism that those are merely trendy options for privileged minorities with the time, space, and money to spare. People seem to clamor for a solution to totalitarianism that is itself a totality. The idea that an ecological conformity to the world may manifest itself in a diverse array of tactics while being part of a unified strategy of changing perspectives and challenging a history of destruction seems to be unsatisfactory to many people. But I believe, uh, with what may be more conviction than reason, that a phenomenological comportment towards ecological issues, very largely construed, meaning, for example, urban spaces, or as right for eco phenomenology as uh, traditional folk natural spaces, um, this, this sort of Comportment does provide an answer to our larger environmental problems. In my example, although framed as a sort of family discussion over what is essential to nature of hunting, the life worldly repercussions are extended outward. Historically, for instance, some of the earliest and most widespread environmental protection efforts were undertaken by hunters and fishermen for obvious reasons. Every meal procured through access to the commons rather than enclosed monetized space was a resistance to agribusiness and commodity culture at large. State agencies respond to this public demand by reclaiming private property for the public good. The do-it-yourself ethos permeates this relationship, cultivating similar anti-market-based trajectories. And in fact, I think we're on the cusp of a very interesting intermingling of the far right and far left in America based on a shared interest in self-sufficiency and suspicion of the business world. In short, encouraging the kind of human-animal relationship of the hunter of the commons and dissuading the highway accident relationships and the genetically manipulated camp hunting relationships extends in effect throughout a web of ecologically connected resistances all the way up to climate change, our most apocalyptic environmental crisis. This, in conclusion, is my uh, maybe somewhat utopian claim that vacillating perspectives back and forth from background political ethical commitments such as environmentalism to phenomenological descriptions of experience reveals the real consequences of our attitudes for the natural world and allows us to chart a trajectory for establishing a less disruptive future. Questions for uh, Johnny and you may go ahead and field your own questions. I'd like to 
I just wanted to pick up on the, the phrase less destructive mm -hmm. um, because and I, um, I like the idea of it, but let's say I was doing deconstruction one-on-one -on -one and I wanted to ask what, what's the condition for the possibility of the lived experience or the supposedly mm -hmm. um, <coughs> proper, more natural, like, less, less technological. And it seems to me the word uh, is techno, which is somehow uh, not lived. Mm -hmm. right? But the condition, so if I'm just doing my, you know, Gerardian rap, I would say, well, the condition for the possibility of your lived experience is techno. Right? You have to have a gun, a thermos, a mm -hmm. uh, car to get you out there. And so that this supposed distinction between the Virilio, well, let's not even talk about the, the uh, biopolitical pattern of the bird, um, cannot be one that's ontological. Uh, it comes in by moral fear, mm -hmm. this notion. Um, and so uh, there's, there's one sense in which this, this phrase is less destructive. <laughs> Um, comes in, you know, deus ex machina at the end, uh, and, and lives the lie of the complicity between the hunter that goes out and that isn't the canned high fence mm -hmm. hunter, um, and isn't the person consuming meat from wherever. Um, but yet, is the condition, of the, their, the possibility of their activity is still bound up with the same system. So it's not that it has to be absolutely pure. I, I take you there. You know, that's that's you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, where the lesser violence is, is still better than the worst violence. Um, but there still seems to me that there's a, there's a problem in, in this conception of less destructive and how you validate it once the condition for the possibility of the less destructive is precisely um, the same thing that enables techno science uh, and driving. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not sure that I agree that the condition of the possibility is the same and, and as a whole, like, variety of ways you can be encountering nature in this way. Um, one of the pieces, when I, this, this piece, the small selection here is from a much larger piece, I actually presented with a panel of uh, vegans and raw Buddhists, and I was more engaged with that specific uh, yeah. discussion. So it was more like, there's no such thing as stepping back, like Peter Singer uh, talks about hunting, he says somewhere like, compared to domesticated animals, uh, the animals living in the woods like deer that we hunt would be happy and free if we just left them alone. And that's yeah. never been true, right? Yeah. So your technique, we've never, there's never yes. been a natural world, there's never been a human, yeah. of course, right? Yeah. So it is it is a continuum. And like the particular way, um, I'm trying to get to like your specific question. Uh, it, it's, it's just a continuum. We're always engaged and it's always back and forth. Deer have never been outside of human, I mean, uh, yeah. in, in North right. America, last 10,000 years ago. We've managed land for them. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I think that's that's like all my answers. Specific. It's against a perfectionism in environmental thought and food ethics mm -hmm. and analytics. There's always this sort of perfectionist thing. So that's mm -hmm. why less destructive came in. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I answered your question about technique specifically, but. The, I'm pushing back against the perfectionism and against the neither or in an absolute dogma. No, I think I think you did answer it if you say that the deer, are, like the deer, are technological. Right. Uh, yeah, and then I'm yeah, fine. Then I'm fine. Yeah, you know, then it's a more or less. Yeah. I was actually, as you were talking, and I'm going to ask you to make sense of something that I experienced, which is totally unfair. So I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize in advance for that. Um, as you were talking, I was struck by. Um, what something that happened on, a co on the college campus I went to after college in Baltimore. It's like really tiny, to be to be a school that could very perhaps be very lots of families, activists, and such there. Um, and we had a huge, we had a deer problem, right? Yeah. A deer problem. Basically, we've developed this whole typical, right? And mm -hmm. then there's less room, just as a deer. Uh, deer running around like they're quad, people freaking out. It, seriously, it was a thing during mating season. There was people were in the dorms, which is what I thought was hilarious. Um, and so anyway, what happened was they had, well, there, there was this, the solution that was arranged was a hunt, an organized hunt, where also to the people would be given to homeless shelters. Um, so like, there was something that sort of seemed to try to appeal to everyone in, the, in this way that you're sort of less destructive, less, um, um, less destructive, but. Yeah, and part of the problem is that we killed all of the natural predators in North America. So, yeah. um, and then we 
take more habitat. So you have these pressures, right? And there's no getting away from the fact that populations have pressures on each other. Um, yeah, but the, anyway, so it, was, it was interesting was, so this was arranged, and two days before this was arranged, someone on the campus had to take it upon themselves to begin the hunt, I suppose, on their own. And <laughs> shot a deer, which it, it, it's not, it's, it is funny, but then it kind of goes horrible. So I'm just gonna warn you, um, someone shot a deer with an arrow, bow and arrow, not like a Ted Nugent bow and arrow either, like a, you know, regular bow and arrow. And um, it took, I mean, they, they suspect it's probably the virus from it, and probably died from a collapsed lung, which very slow people did. And just thinking about this problem of less destructive, that the solutions, that we come to that they, I don't know, that sometimes what they open up is more horrible mm -hmm. than what they have, what yeah. they try to close off, and I don't know how to, the thing I've never had to, had the opportunity to have anyone help me explain. So, so again, more experience, so. so sorry, I know that was. Yeah, yeah. Real quick. So just around. again, it's kind of this like perfectionist thing, the less, less destructive. Uh, there's a good book by Chobar Saruli, or actually he has a good essay called Honey and Like a Vegetarian, and he wrote a media for book called The Mindful Carnivore after it. But um, he was a, a vegan for years and years, and he found out this organic farmer that he buys all his vegetables from at the farmer's markets and smoke bombing and gopher or, or, or chemical bombing and they kill them all. And he starts thinking about all the death involved in his like crunchiest, like best veggies he gets from the farmer he knows. And like that's, that, that's why this example is good. Like you're always you're on your campus or whatever, you're always pushing against these violent relationships that you can't avoid in life. Like absolutely, if we're gonna live here, other things are gonna die. So, so sorry, that's probably the sense of it. It was my fault, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so let's do it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be a real jerk about the time limits up here, but there will be time for um, for uh, uh, questions later. So, okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Donovan Irvin, who is presenting his paper, "Phenomenological Reconciliation: Embodiment in the Extended Mind." So. This conference has given me a lot to think about, and I sort of shifted directions and focus a little bit, so you'll forgive the somewhat extemporaneous exposition uh, that I'm about to give. But that said, um, I sort of was thinking uh, to come here to talk about a, a, a reconciliation between uh, analytic philosophy, at least where philosophy of mind is concerned, and continental philosophy, um, particularly the phenomenological and existential um, uh, traditions. So um, the reason I want to focus on uh, philosophy of mind is because this is an area that's recently been receptive to continental philosophy and particularly phenomenolo uh, phenomenology. And this comes about mainly because analytic philosophy has been searching for a non-Cartesian uh, account of the mind. 20th century analytic philosophy was bogged down in uh, theories of computationalism, uh, reductionisms. So under computationalism you had a sort of central processing unit that you know did all of the work on sense perception and bundled it all together. You can sort of see how this is a, an extension of Kantianism, but also operating on the metaphor of the uh, hardware software, right? The, you have the brain, which is the hardware, and it executes the software, and it you know interprets the world or, or constructs experience. There's different strains of, of this um, and different kinds of uh, ways to play that metaphor out. And then, of course, the reductionism. Well, we want to get rid of mental states. We want to reduce things to brain function, reduce the, all, all of the qualia to brain, uh, to brain functioning. A lot of different versions of that. Probably the most extreme is the church lens, the limit of materialism. You know, we just get rid of qualia. When I say, you know, I'm in pain, I'm actually saying something like my C synapses are firing and so on and, and so forth. Um, needless to say, this failed. I mean, um, computationalism and research programs and AI have not succeeded in producing any kind of artificial intelligence. They've never passed the Turing test. I mean, it's just not, a, it's not been a productive research program, this idea that you'll have some sort of like central processing unit that just solves all of the problems magically um, has been somewhat of a philosophical pipe dream. Interestingly enough, uh, when people started to consider embodiment seriously and recursive functions from dynamic systems theory analysis and feedback loops where, in fact, you don't have a central processing unit, but you have many kinds of sensory input feeding into a machine that's able to produce a much higher level of um, operative uh, efficacy. Um, it can, machines can go around and collect uh, uh, 
bottles from the office and all that using these various inputs. And it, it's much more successful at producing what we might describe as autonomous action um, or mimicking decision-making uh, prospects. So because of that success, people started to take this idea of embodiment seriously, and they started looking at literature on embodiment, and then they discovered Mervyn Ponty, and then they heard about phenomenology all of a sudden, and it didn't, and now, oh boy, we can talk about this stuff. Um, but there's still some reticence in analytic philosophy to fully open up this can of worms just because of the institutional politics that have uh, gone into the analytic continental divide um, over, the, over the years. Um, but, but this search for non-Cartesianism, I mean, you know, you can trace this back to Gilbert Ryle and the ghost in the machine. And uh, many of you probably know Gilbert Ryle has actually uh, reviewed Heidegger's Being in Time. And although he was very skeptical of the phenomenological uh, research project, he had high, high praise. I just want to remind people of this because I find it interesting. Um, so Gilbert Ryle, in his review, said, um, of being in time, said it is very difficult. Uh, it is a very difficult and important work, which marks a big advance in the application of the phenomenological method. Though I may say at once, I suspect that this advantage is that uh, this advance is an advance towards disaster. <laughs> and may, maybe maybe Heidegger would like that. I, I don't know. Um, but then he goes on at the end to say, but though I deplore the damage wrought upon metaphysics by the presuppositions which Heidegger has unconsciously inherited. I have nothing but admiration for his special undertaking and for such of his achievement, uh, achievements in it as I can follow, namely, the phenomenological analysis of the root workings of the human soul. He shows himself to be a thinker of real importance by the em uh, immense subtlety and searchingness of his examination of consciousness, by the boldness and originality of his methods and conclusions, and by the unflagging energy which he tries to think behind the stock categories of orthodox philosophy and psychology. And I must also say in this behalf that while it is my personal opinion that qual first philosophy, phenomenology is at present heading for bankruptcy and disaster, it will end either in self-ruinous objectivism or in a windy mysticism, perhaps a little foresight there <laughs> in terms of people's critique of Heidegger, right? I hazard this opinion with humility and with reservations since I am well aware of how far I have fallen short of understanding this difficult work. So I think uh, as a sidebar, it would be interesting to sort of construct a minor, uh, a minor literature on phenomenology within analytic philosophy, sort of to, to use Deleuze's um, idea of a minor literature in the interesting project, but, so, but I digress. So, this rediscovery of phenomenology within analytic circles, or at least among uh, analytically trained people, is interesting because I frame it this way, saying, oh, well, you know, they're looking for non-Cartesian explanations for mind. Well, wait a minute. Husserl, who all of these people like to cite and talk about, was a Cartesian, right? I mean, Cartesian meditations. He starts with the ego, you know? He goes on and he, he uh, accepts that. Um, sort of uh, spot, he, 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 he's not a dualist, right? I don't mean Cartesian in that sense, but he has this idea of the ego as this, and you could maybe draw an analogy between the ego and the sort of central processing unit, that there's this one point that's in relation to the world that from which my intentionality is directed. Interestingly, I think exactly what happens uh, and what shows the efficacy of Husserl's uh, phenomenology, which, um, I wanted to uh, maybe apply some definitions of this so we're not just sort of spinning our wheels. Um, so Sokolowski calls phenomenology the study of human experience and of the ways things present themselves to us in and through such experience. Smith says the study of structures of consciousness is experienced from the first person point of view. Uh, Moran says way of seeing um, what appears to be as such. Um, the manner of its appearing and the how of its manifestation, that's uh, sort of a paraphrase of Postrow from itself and the very way in which it shows itself from itself, which is a little more uh, difficult to sort of grasp. Now, this definition is different from phenomenological methodology, uh, which uh, I want to try to sort of suggest that it actually has something very much in common with analytic philosophy, which is that it's a, a, a rigorous conceptual analysis and that roots it in, in hermeneutics. So I think Heidegger is moving in the right direction, right? And when I say conceptual analysis, the concepts, concepts by which our, our experience is structured, right? What does Heidegger call the project of being in time? Dasein analysis, right? It's a rigorous sort of uh, analysis that I think has some uh, more connections. And I hope that people will argue with me about that and talk a little bit more with me about that later because uh, I'm 
sort of venturing in here as a response to last night's talk and some of the things that we talked about after the fact, right? So what does what does uh, Husserl sort of attempt to do this? What does his interpretation of our experience yield? Interestingly, I think it breaks down upon the examination of the inner subjectivity. He moves along very smoothly with very interesting results with the ego as his basis until in the fifth meditations of, um, of his Cartesian meditations when all of a sudden this sort of infinite gap opens up between myself and the other. And, and I'm not saying that Husserl is not concerned with inner subjectivity. He does a lot of really good work and he's obviously very sympathetic to it. But the account that he gives, the intentional account, doesn't support the kind of philosophical work he wants inner subjectivity to do. So I think actually the, the, the failure of Husserl to account for this is actually a positive result of phenomenology because it opens the door to the dissolution of the ego. So one of the first and most important um, contributions of phenomenology is exactly the dissolution of the ego, and this is where Heidegger gets going. This is an actual result of phenomenological analysis, this loss of ego, I will say. Now, um, so of course, I want to uh, sort of uh, qualify this. Uh, Husserl's Cartesianism is a Cartesianism in the shadow of Kant, right? So when I say the dissolution of the ego, when we turn phenomenological analysis inside, it's similar to Hume's uh, concern, right? That like, oh, I don't see this ego, I don't have any experience of this ego, I get this sort of uh, constant shift in experience. And that's exactly why if, if if Husserl's analysis mimics, uh, leads us to sort of mimic that argument, well then it's no surprise that Heidegger turns to Kant and says in the, the preface to the third edition of the Kant book, um, I sought in Kant the answer to the questions I sought, and I sought it exactly in the schematism where the categories were put into relationship with time. So um, just some historical notes. Uh, Heidegger basically thinks Husserl hasn't been phenomenological enough Right? He still has all this conceptual baggage that he gets um, from Cartesian analysis. Now, let's, uh, why am I talking about all this stuff of phenomenology and how does that relate to the analytic philosophers? Well, it's exactly in this embedded, extended, uh, inactive, and uh, uh, embodied sort of theory of mind that phenomenology gets the most play. Sean Gallagher, uh, you know, Dan Zahivi, uh, Evan Thompson, so on and so forth, all of these people. I want to focus on Mark Rollins because he's particularly interested in um, uh, phenomenology and he gives the sort of most direct treatment of, of Heidegger. Andy Clark names his book Being There, um, has a throwaway reference to Heidegger on the first page and then spends the next 140 pages talking about robots. And of course, Heidegger would just say, well, you're leveling down. You know, this is just technologically driven, mediated, computational. There's no, uh, there, there's this, it's still too wedded to the particular science and, and not ontological enough. The reason that Rollins is interesting uh, to me is because he takes embodiedness and extendedness, uh, extended mind, to be the important things we're working with. So when we talk about extended mind, we're trying to move beyond that sort of inside the head computational approach, right? The brain, the cranial container is not necessarily important. And under uh, Roland's reading and several others, when I engage with the world, my engagement with certain objects in the world that are not part of my body are constitutive of cognitive function. They don't contribute to it. My, my mental functioning doesn't depend upon them. The actual manipulation of object is constitutive of cognition, right? This is a claim about the kind of entity that cognitive acts are. Now, um, I want to rein this in a little bit. It's not as if my pen is always a part of the mind. No, it's a part of the mind when I'm using it in a process, right? It's procedural, it's, uh, it's process. Embeddedness for Ro Rollins doesn't cut it, right? You can be embedded in a context, you can be embedded in a world, but you can still sort of just use that as something that the mind sort of clings onto or globs onto. Um, inactivism doesn't cut it because, yeah, I can use things and I can pick them up, but that's not necessarily constitutive. He claims that embodiedness and extendedness is um, constitutive of the act. Now, where Rollins starts to sort of take a misstep is when he identifies this as ontic. Well, if you've sort of done your work to just uh, to sort of dissolve the ego and to move beyond the container uh, metaphor, you've actually lapsed into a kind of uh, ontological position where you're starting to talk about the conditions of the possibility for uh, 
the, uh, something like what we want to call mind uh, to arise, or something like these cognitive acts um, can arise. Now, the reason I think he makes some of these missteps, and the, the reason why they're still talking about mind is almost like a kind of entity, right? They make these caveats to process, and they make these you know, sort of, uh, uh, the, oh, we want to be non-Cartesian, but they're still sort of talking about this nebulous sort of entity that we want to call mind. I, I want to really argue that they just need to, they need to take the plunge. They see Heidegger as like a can of worms, or they see Merleau-Ponty as a can of worms, and they want to like point at the can of worms and say, oh, here's some interesting things, let me sort of pull some labels off of it and pat patch it in here. I, I say, buy the can of worms, take it home, open it up, let them run out, um, it's great, you know, you'll, you'll find a lot of really great conceptual resources uh, to, to do the work. The thing that makes me say this is that Rowland's claims, uh, despite all of his, uh, he claims that um, the f one of the fundamental features of mind is not that it's intentional, it's not that it does these cognitive pro pro processes, it's that it's revelatory, it's disclosure, um, and it's this play on concealing and unconcealing, right? As I direct my attention toward the pen, other things are concealed, other things fall away, other things are highlighted. Um, and this, um, this sort of, uh, plays on an old uh, uh, Gibson, uh, sort of was a reviled um, uh, biologist, I guess, back in the day, but he had this notion of affordances, right? That the environment afford afforded me certain opportunities uh, given my very particular relationship with it. So I am the kind of thing that can drink water and a pool of water affords me the opportunity to drink it. And this circumvents uh, certain subject-object problems because it's not as if the subject purely determines the uh, object, or that the object purely determines the subject, but that there's what Deleuze would call a mutual presupposition. There's an interdependency, an interpenetration there in which those things mutually form one another. The subject affects the environment, the environment affects the subject, there's this kind of feedback loop, and they both influence and inform one another. Um, it's a, a more robust picture and one that allows us to sort of circumvent some of these sticky issues with subject and object. Um, and so uh, this notion um, of the, uh, again, so the, since the ego has fallen away, we can't just rely on the subject to do all the work then and fall back on the subject-object dichotomy. We need a sort of more mutually formative thing. Um, and this is exactly the kind of work I think that phenomenology, uh, and I'll, I think it's probably been obvious that my emphasis has been on, on Heidegger here, um, that's the exact thing that we want mind to do. Um, and that's the exact thing that these analytics are trying to account for. Now, um, this is not a new <laughs> idea, right? This idea of a disclosure is not new. I think Heidegger would be happy to hear me say that we could go back to the Greeks um, and find uh, some uh, some some insight into this, and not just Greek philosophy, but go back even further to Greek literature at, to Homer. Uh, Homer, uh, if you, I did a sort of a look uh, through Homer's uh, Iliad and Odyssey to see where nous, uh, the term we translate for mind, is used. About 36 instances of it being attributed to characters in the in the Odyssey. About 48 or so in the in the uh, Iliad, used for all different ways. Judgment. Um, uh, planning, intentional purposefulness, but also to be disclosed, something that you share with people, to take counsel with others, to open up and put forth, uh, also wit. Um, and so I'll close um, with a little uh, bit of poetics, um, also from a Homeric hymn to Hermes, uh, the, the Hermenoid, right? The messenger of the gods, where we get the word hermeneutics. Hermes, one of his most defining features was his wit, his noose, and it's with this noose that he made the turtles sing. And so Hermes' noose um, changed the world in such a way that it opened up new possibilities, new affordances, new ways of being. For humans, uh, he made uh, the turtles sing. And so I would suggest to the analytics that through continental philosophy, through the phenomenological and existential tradition, we can explain bodily emplacement and through this bodily emplacement and cognitive extension into the world, we ourselves make the world sing. Thank you. Um, I'm having some difficulty with your use of affordances. Mm -hmm. uh, your
reference to presuppositions tests. Um, the problem I have is that the, it seems to me that the water pool does not presuppose a water drinker. Okay. So the, you know, this almost interagency of some kind of presupposition for each, mm -hmm. the water pool seems to lack what would be needed for that kind of co-presupposition status, it seems. Yeah, I think that that's a little bit too much of a totalized view of it. It's when the two things come into relation with one another. So yeah, you're absolutely right. The pool doesn't, it doesn't pr provide the, it's not always there to be drank from. But when certain kinds of beings enter into their relationship with the pool, the pool becomes the kind of thing that can be drank from. But the it is that in virtue of its relation to some other thing that's in the world with it. And it defines also the way in which that thing can drink from it. So it's only when the two are brought into conjunction with one another that the mutual presupposition holds. It's not a, a totalitizing thing that is at all places at all times. It's a, it's a kind of a historical ontology to use the enhancing uh, phrase. Did I think of the pool of water too much as being in itself then? I think so. And uh, and I I want to suggest, and I, I can't fully articulate this yet, but I think that we can pursue this toward um, making more robust metaphysical claims through phenomenology because there's less of a problem with this, like, well, the subject is inside of itself and cut off from the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, that's uh, still sort of formative in my thoughts, and I'm, I'm doing some research on that now, so. But I hope that's helpful. Here's a starting place, yes, thank you. Thanks. Yes? It's tricky in, in Husserl because Husserl is so um, sympathetic to it and acknowledging of like all of the important roles that inner subjectivity plays. And he does a lot of work, good work, work with it elsewhere. But my claim is that when he tries to substantiate that, when he tries to give us the account, the intentional account of inner subjectivity, that ends up collapsing because of the distance between egos, right? And so he starts to say, how do I know that there are other people out there that are like me? Well, I perform this sort of comparative analysis. And this is why people, I think, mistakenly critique Husserl for saying, oh, well, you're just reducing them to the same. I don't think that he's necessarily reducing them to the same. And then he makes the pairing, right? He tries to go through this sort of convoluted path where I say, well, I encountered the other person, but I don't have access to their intentional stance, so I do this pairing function. And then I say, well, they must be like me in some way, so I can reasonably infer that they have this sort of like intentional stance as well. And for me, that just doesn't, that just doesn't ring phenomenologically true. I think when Heidegger's talking about encountering others, he's just better at that, right? I don't encounter some person-like thing out in the world. I encounter someone as some, something that I can relate to and talk with, and as a speaker of language, and as, you know, I can go, I see the person working, and they're at work, you know? They're not some thing that I encounter, and then I have to be like, well, wait, wait a minute, do you have this internal uh, intentionality? So. I don't know if that's helpful, but for me, when, when Husserl starts to talk about this intersubjective stuff, within his discourse, this like distance opens up between myself and the other person, and he's in a position where he has to account for like an infinite gap in this leap 
to then postulate that there's an existence of the other there. And I just don't, I, I think he failed, he fails on that count.
Writing must be interrogated to come to an understanding of what it is, that is, what its essence is. In attempting to answer the question of the essence of the technology of writing, I will follow a general line of thought somewhat parallel, not just somewhat, parallel, to uh, Martin Heidegger's investigation in the question concerning technology, which from here on I'll just refer to as the question. I will also draw on the work of uh, Eric A. Havelock in his book, uh, The Preface to Plato, and Walter J. Ong in his work, Orality and Literacy, in order to bring out writing's essence and the ways in which it conditions that which appears. By answering these questions, I will eliminate not only writing itself, but also the ways in which its force was concealed from Heidegger's keen and unconcealing eye. Allow me to begin with a brief discussion of how I will understand the essence in this paper. Essence is often thought of as the whatness of some thing. This is what Heidegger calls the correct understanding of essence. The correct understanding is not the essence that I'm searching for, although it begins to lead the way to the sense of essence that I'm after. The essence that I want to bring out is the same type of essence that Heidegger looks for in the question. Instead of the whatness or Latin quiditas of a thing as merely a derivative type of essence, Heidegger is looking for a more fundamental essence uh, in the sense of quoting David Carell, um, the way in which something pursues its course the way in which it remains through time as what it is, end quote. So originally, essence is the way that something endures as presence, or rather the way in which it endures and comes to presence. Moreover, a thing's essence is also the way in which it discloses being. As stated above, a true, the true essence of anything, in our case writing, must be sought through the correct essence or whatness of that thing. Thus, the what of writing must be laid bare. And as stated already, we must understand that it is first of all a technology, and more specifically a technological modification of language in its originary oral form. Um, and language itself conditions all of our thought and revealing to some extent. I think a brief moment of introspection shows this as each and all of our thoughts are structured through language. Stated more simply, we think in our native language, or at least some language that we know. This must be kept in mind because writing as a modification of language will also modify in characterizing technology in general, Heidegger says that it is, quote, a means to an end, a human activity, and also a contrivance. I want to focus on the last of these characteristics. Contrivance here is the translation of the Latin instrumentum, which has connotations of arrangement, adjustment, or equipment. These words begin to hint at the correct essence of writing. In its whatness, writing is equipment that adjusts and arranges. We must now ask, in what ways does it uh, arrange and adjust? It is in Ong's work that we find an answer to this question. As he points out, writing is the act of, quote, committing the spoken word to visual space, end quote. In a purely oral setting, words are spoken utterances that are themselves lived occurrences or events. As such, they take place within time, in a rich, lived context, and they are conditioned by sound. In this way, the spoken word is more of a mode of action, whereas the written word is mostly a, quoting on again, a countersign of thought. Countersign basically just being counterpart, I think is what he means. Writing an act of transformation of, quoting on again, the evanescent world of sound to the quiescent, quasi-permanent world of space, end quote. And in doing so, it arranges and adjusts human's bot into this world of space. In order to see the effects of this adjustment of the word to space, I must turn back to Heidegger. It is important to note that all technology belongs within uh, the sense of the Greek techne, which as Heidegger explains is a mode of bringing forth. As such, technology is always a mode of revealing. Further, as a type of revealing, it's intimately li linked to episteme or knowledge, since what one can know must first be revealed. Moreover, Writing has a further con connection to revealing through its intimate relationship with language. Heidegger insinuates this in the question with his discussion of the Greek verb legain to say and logos, which as we know has many different translations, some of which speech, word, reason, or account. These two terms are related to the Greek apophaniste, which is to bring forward into appearance. As such, legain and logos, which are both originally terms for spoken language, are modes of revealing as bringing forth into appearance. And writing is essentially a technological modification on the original and oral mode of revealing that belongs to these terms. 
In a non-Heideggerian sense, this amounts to saying that language conditions what types of thinking can be done and determines, quote, uh, quoting on, um, the way in which experience is intellectually organized, end quote. Thus, in terms of the whatness of writing, we can say that it arranges and adjusts our thought, that it conditions new modes of revealing, and as techne is essentially connected to bringing forth and revealing. I will now turn to how all of this actually takes place and how it conditions all of these things. First of all, writing as the commitment of the spoken word to visual space is a further level of symbolization beyond the spoken word. Oral utterances are themselves representations of entities within the world, and written words are not on this same level of abstraction. Rather, the written words are representations of those spoken words, and not just representations of the things in the world. As such, writing is what Ong calls a uh, secondary modeling system. Whereas language in its spoken form is a primary modeling system. Ong explains, quoting him, thought is nested in speech, not in texts, all of which have their meanings through reference of the visible symbol to the world of sound. What the reader is seeing on this page are not real words, but coded symbols whereby a properly informed human being can evoke in his or her consciousness real words and actual or imagined sound. This is an important insight because writing's mode of revealing will carry with it the further distancing from our experience of the world. Writing makes revealing itself more distanced from the interactive, lived world, and it makes what appears more symbolic and abstract. Through this further level of removal from one's interactive experience of the world, writing creates a new sort of discourse that is, as Ong calls it, context-free or autonomous. Uh, autonomous not being like Kantian autonomy, but just standing alone. Writing makes language and the thoughts expressed in it autonomous, standing alone, as ripped from the interactively lived context of morality, and placed in the timelessness of the written word. Further, it allows an individual person to effectively be their own interlocutor, such that sustained thought can take place in a completely solitary setting, which is sort of a big deal in just the history. How is thought and revealing affected by this further level of detachment from a more interactive lived experience? What now reveals itself? I'm in full agreement with Ong that this detachment makes words more thing-like, and as such puts more of an emphasis on discrete individual entities. What writing does is to give words a visual presence, and as such it shifts human thought and language out of the sound-oriented world of morality to the visually-oriented world of literacy. This new focus on sight has had a profound impact on thought. As Ong points out, sight focuses on isolation, whereas sound relies on incorporation. Also, sight situates the observer outside of what is seen and puts them at a distance from the thing that is viewed. What specific effects does this have? Uh, I think there are two main effects that the thing-like nature of written words and this new emphasis on vision have for thought and revealing. First of all, with writing and its isolating tendencies, the new ideal for coming to know something is clarity, as opposed to the old oral ideal of harmony. The ideal of vision is to observe something or entity as static, motionless, and in complete isolation. In the oral tradition, there was a manifold from one's existential context that was taken in at once, but the new literate ideal is to weed out most of the manifold aspects of experience so as to ensnare an object in a still setting and observe it from all the context itself must be concealed so as to isolate what is being viewed. What this does is it makes one interpret the world and the entities within it in a more thing-like manner. As words are understood as discrete visual entities, the things that the words represent are interpreted in the same way. As Eric Havelock states in his preface to Plato on this same point, quote, Here then is the concept of an object, fiercely isolated from time, place, and circumstance, and translated linguistically into abstraction and then put forward as the goal of a prolonged intellectual investigation." End quote. Instead of the richness and manifoldness of, uh, of an oral context, one has individual, static, discrete entities or, or objects that are brought forth into appearance. This new emphasis on sight places the individual observer in a new relation to the world. This is the second effect of the thing like status. Instead of being the auditory center of an oral wor world and context, the sight-oriented literate person is placed in a one-to-one -one relation to these static objects. 
The object is revealed as a discrete and present thing, and the observer is revealed as similar in its discreteness and presence. A discrete subject who observes is identified, and this subject, like the objects, can now be viewed apart from the context it exists in. Further, not only does writing's new emphasis on vision enact this new sort of relation, but also the act of writing itself helps to do this. As Ong points out, quote, writing and reading are solitary activities that throw the psyche back on itself, end quote. In speech, an interlocutor is absolutely necessary for sustained thought. However, writing is done as a mostly solipsistic activity, and as such, it makes a person her own interlocutor for sustained thought. Not only that, but the visual preservation of the word that writing affords allows one to go back over what thoughts they have written out and correct or adjust them at will. This sets up a new interiority that helps to develop what has come to be known as subjectivity. Havelock echoes these same claims about subjectivity when he is discussing Plato and his doctrine of the soul. According to Havelock, the literate tradition that Plato was ushering in transformed the way that people thought about their own identity. Havelock explains that the understanding of one's soul or suke changed so that, quoting Havelock, instead of signifying a man's ghost or wraith or a man's breath or his lifeblood, a thing devoid of sense and self-consciousness, it came to mean the ghost that thinks, that is capable both of moral decision and of scientific cognition, and is the seat of moral responsibility, something infinitely precious, an essence unique in the whole realm of nature." End quote. Instead of identifying oneself with the oral tradition, people began to conceive of themselves as unique individual subjects that think. As Havelock explains, the oral tradition relies on self-surrender to the poetic experience of oral tradition. However, this is done away with through the rise of literacy, as the conditions for subjectivity are established through and made possible by writing. So writing makes words more thing-like. This new thing-like status of words is then reflected in the way in which one views the world and the entities within it that the words represent. The world is represented through writing in terms of discrete objects, and this isolation of objects conceals the rich manifold and interactive context of the world one experiences. This is to say that writing brings forth, that is, reveals discrete entities within the world as merely present. These visual objects are isolated from their context, their actions, and the feelings they evoke in the observer. They become abstracted from everything except their mere presence and appearing. Also, the new visual focus that is brought on by writing furthers this isolation of discrete objects, and it establishes a distinct and isolated subject. All the characteristics and descriptions of writing and its effects have helped us to travel down the path towards writing's true essence. What essence is to be found here? What is revealed through the correct essence of writing, on our way now to the true essence, is the conditions for objectivity. That is, a distinct subject and discrete objects out in the world that are merely present, or to use Heidegger's term, merely present at hand, as modified out of their originary ready-to-hand appearance. We have now arrived at the true essence of the technology of writing. The true essence of writing is the revealing or disclosure of entities within the world as present at hand. In fact, this act of bringing forth um, objects as merely present at hand happens literally at the location of the hand. When the hand, in its activity, writes the word and preserves it in visual space, the entire process of object objectification has been set in motion. The hand is what first makes writing possible, and once it has begun to write, the old oral mode of revealing has already begun to be replaced. So it is that the modification out of ready-to-handness and into present-at-handness actually takes place at the hand, that is, when the writing utensil meets its surface. As Heidegger points out in his lecture series on Parmenides, quoting Heidegger, the hand exists as hand only where there is disclosure and concealment, end quote. As I have shown above, writing is itself a mode of disclosure, that is revealing, and as such is essentially tied to concealing. Writing not only conceals uh, the um, oral existential context within which spoken words are uttered, but also conceals orality itself and its modes of disclosure. In fact, it does so in a way analogous to what Heidegger has to say about the typewriter. Heidegger, in speaking of the typewriter, says that this machine, quote, tears writing from the essential realm 
But what was concealed from Heidegger himself is that writing is already an act of tearing language and the spoken word out of the essential realm of mouth and body. The typewriter conceals handwriting, yet handwriting conceals the spoken word. Even Havelock noticed this concealing power of writing when he states, quote, it does not occur to us that once upon a time it was necessary for it to have been discovered and defined and insisted on so that we could easily and complacently inherit it, it being writing. End quote. Writing traps the spoken word in visual space, and in doing so conceals its own concealing act from us. With, with this in mind, we can now view one of Heidegger's quotes on the typewriter as having the same force when thought about in terms of writing. So in the first line here, Heidegger's talking about the cloud, and the cloud, as most of us probably know, is uh, lethe concealment of um, and so quoting Heidegger on the typewriter, he said, uh, yeah, quoting Heidegger on the typewriter, he says, Therefore the cloud, within action, leads the way astray, leads outside of what the thinking ahead, the reflecting, and the commemorating provide when they are guided by awe. Transposed into concealment as such a darkening, man stands in a certain way outside of what is unconcealed. Writing is an action of the hand enacts a new and derivative mode of revealing that presents the world as full of discrete objects there for one's visual inspection, and in doing so conceals the spoken word in the rich existential context that the spoken word needs to survive and to have its significance. That is to say, it places us at a distance or outside of what is unconcealed. Uh, and so from what has been laid out above, right, we can see that the true essence of writing has made itself clear. It starts with the idea that language conditions all thought. Writing as a technological modification of language is thus also a modification of thought. Writing pulls words out of their rich and full existential context, thus making them thing-like. And this places a new emphasis on vision instead of sound. And once the visually oriented thing-like interpretation of words has been interiorized, it becomes the way that human beings interpret the things in the world that the words represent. As a result, entities within the world are revealed just like the written words themselves, and the context that surrounds and situates these entities is concealed. The entities themselves are then revealed as objects. This modification is a shift from ready-to-hand interpretations of entities to the present-at-hand interpretation that spawns our ideas of objectivity. Also, this shift to the present-at-hand literally takes place at from this, it is clear that the essence of writing, that is its mode of disclosure, the way in which it endures and presences, is precisely the disclosure of entities as present. Thank you. Um, uh, here and then. don't know yet, but I think it's really, really cool, and I think it's just historically sort of a newer thing that people are doing with writing, and really trying to make a conscious effort to be non-representative in the way that they're using it. Like the pollinator? Yeah, that's, that's, still, that's, still pretty, that's still pretty new in the 2600 year history of, of writing, back to our thought. Um, so I don't know exactly how that fits in, but I think that something that's really interesting about that is the way in which people wholly within a literate culture are, without maybe even explicitly, trying to do things with writing that go against sort of the structures that writing has put in place, which I think is really interesting. I mean, to some extent, I think that's what Heider is doing in Being in Time or something like that, right? Is trying to get outside of the literate modes of thought while doing it through literacy. Um, so I don't know if that sort of addresses. Basically, I don't know yet, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> uh, to Richard, back. I was, uh, well, I was not thinking on the model of thesis, truth and lies, and narrative, of course. But I guess I got to think it's with the end of your essay here. 
Uh, I mean, I, I would agree, and I think that the Standing Reserve and uh, Gestell in general are sort of the next thing I need to do with this this project in general. But I think that they're very much related and can fit in with some of the things that I'm saying about writing. Um, just that writing just sort of historically comes first, because as far as I read it, I don't think Heidegger is actually doing the question concerning technology in general. I think Heidegger is doing the question concerning thermodynamic technology. And that's why I see the importance of doing these types of projects first. Okay, if there can be an essence of thermodynamic technology that reveals a certain aspect of the world to us, I think that's great and that's really interesting, but then that means that there's essences of other types of technologies. Um, because as Heidegger himself is doing, he's, I don't think he's doing technology in general. I think it's just thermodynamic technology. Uh, gray jacket here and then up front and then to the back. So, um I, I, I guess I, I, I heard this idea of the uh, the uh, primacy of oral language from Noam Chomsky, the kind of linguistic tradition from that uh, But what, what I keep having in mind and what keeps bothering me is that I feel like this is another reincarnation of the noble savage. So the fact that writing become, comes about later uh, doesn't necessarily seem to suggest to me that oral uh, tradition itself is not uh, a kind of yeah. technology in itself. Yeah. Or perhaps that neither are, but that there's a kind of a, uh, a, a presencing of them out of the, the, the general horizon, that perhaps we're in our attention to them, we're solidifying them as, as objects of in, in some sense that uh, this needs to be done. Is there a question? I mean, I, I basically agree with you. I mean, this is just a sort of a historical point. People didn't have writing, and then people had writing. Right? I don't want to get into noble savage ideas. I don't even really want to make evaluative claims about which one's better, or which mode of disclosure is getting us closer to the truth, or something like that. It's just that at one point, people didn't have writing. At another point, people had writing. It seems like once writing came about, people started to think about things differently. And that's evidence with Plato and the way in which he ushers in a different way of doing metaphysics. Does that speak to your comment? I, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, your, your argument is, is uh, it presumes that, uh, so if, uh, if writing is, uh, you're, you're, in, in that you're, insofar as your argument presumes a primacy to oral tradition, it seems, or that was oral uh, communication, uh, it does, I, I, I'm not understanding how uh, you, uh, it seems such an integral aspect of your argument that, that uh, I guess it is a concern of mine. I, I'm not seeing, I mean, what's the concern? That orality came first or that the way I'm treating it? I'm just. Yes, that, uh, that uh, in that, your, your argument seems to me that, that when we, we start writing, so mm -hmm. this conditions my thought, and I, I'm not, that in, in, in the least bit. But my, my issue is that your, your, your argument is that uh, in the visual space that we end up uh, objectifying the words themselves and that this is doing something different than what we're doing when we're speaking. But I'm wondering if we're actually doing the same thing when we're speaking, it's just that we're paying more attention to the writing because this historically helps later. Yeah, I think that's a good worry. I disagree with you, but I think it's a good worry and something I need to work out. Just one. Um, I guess uh, my, uh, I guess I want to offer a critique uh, that, that is maybe a kind of a Heideggerian critique of of this. Um, so 
the the kind of the essence that you kind of extract from from writing um, is this idea of the present to hand. You use language like um, a turn to vision uh, to uh, viewing things as discrete things. Um, and uh, at one point you refer to this as kind of in a certain sense, causally connected to the emergence of the unique individual subject who thinks. Um, I was going to use that, that phrase. And I guess my concern is that this all sounds very, very modern. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, for example, how are you using modern first before you go? I mean, I'm thinking like, for instance, Kant. Um, so this, uh, you, you talk, you, uh, I'll, I'll get to why, why I think this is a good thing. Um, uh, in the sense that it, um, you talk about space as kind of stable and time as kind of uh, that the, the, the oral nature of time is kind of flowing, um, and uh, this sounds, you know, like uh, very much like the way Kant will speak about time uh, uh, in uh, his uh, critique of the paralogisms. Um, and so my concern about this is that Kant is is a long time after writing. Writing has been has been going for for quite a bit. So my my concern is that if writing was the thing that kind of instituted this turn to vision, this turn to presence at hand, this turn to discrete things, then why does it take so long? And so um, uh, for for these to kind of enter as as the way of thinking, and so it makes me think of like kind of the ethical um, uh, analysis of of the history of being that somebody like Heidegger will offer, where he'll talk about the Greek notion of of phusis, which is very not very much not a, an idea of discrete things, mm -hmm. or um, the medieval notion of creation, um, uh, you know, things as created by God. Um, and so my concern is that it seems, it seems that what you're describing as an essence of writing is, is, is particularly modern, but writing isn't particularly modern, and that kind of concerns me. No, I think that's a really good word. So I would say just sort of speculating a little bit, and this is something I've thought about. Basically, to be able to take literate thought with what I'm trying to say from the point at which, because it's not just when writing comes about, it's when literacy actually becomes an important part of culture and starts to be dispersed into a greater population. Um, but I mean, it's really hard to do all of the metaphysical work to get from Plato to Kant, and I think that's part of the reason it takes so long. I don't, I think Kant is able to give us sort of a system that I think could be read as like literate thought par excellence. But he's only able to do that because of all the other work that everybody else has done to him. I don't think it's a particularly Kantian or modern thing. So, so what you because there's still, I mean, substance ontology is sort of, sort of the, the history of Western philosophy, and other than a few what get, what get considered like heretical thinkers, um, it's basically about discrete things and objects. So, would you see like a sort of this like kind of Kantian modernism as as kind of becoming inevitable once writing is instituted? I'm going to remain agnostic from that. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna, too much. I'm going to relinquish the uh, leveling down and computational understanding of time back to you, sir, um, and open it up to general questions to the panel. You just, you know, you can take our time. Nine minutes. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to continue to call people? But you can ask anyone anything now. So should I just, like, mo sort of moderate? Okay, yeah, yeah. So back here. I, I wanted to do further questions. I really enjoyed your I think this is a really interesting project. If you don't know the word for the end time, like he's, he's, um, he's an art on a rally and, and literacy, and he uses Heidegger on um, Havelock and McLuhan. And so you know, I think there's some really interesting, um, you know, there's a really interesting project here. Um, and so one, one so, so I, I really like the project. I think I'm, I'm interested in sort of, I, I, there's some interesting Camp and, and the McLuhan's and the Ahn's and some of the sort of phenomenological work that I think it really hasn't been explored yet. So there's a lot of I think, interesting potential there. So the, the one thing I'm sort of thinking of though is um, maybe to sort of help folks like, answer one of your questions that is a uh, adding Postman a little bit in this. There's a, you know, the, there's a section on where he talks about like the, from the I think the theaters where the gap. The sort of like the Egyptian guy coming down and giving giving writing to us and just the yeah, right? And then yeah, yeah. And he, he says, the, so the, the, no, the, sorry, the, the, the scribe kind of writes writing, but the guy thinks like, you know, this great technological invention, and the, the guy basically says, I'm like, you idiot, don't you see here you're going to change memory, right? Now you won't remember things. So, and so that's always the thing I found fascinating about this sort of media ecology is that they, there is a sort of an ethical component to it that they sort of say, look how it changes the notion of the human. And so I think there's a lot of good stuff that you can do with Don Allen and Heidegger and ethical questions. So I don't think you have to be confined to just the, you know, there's a lot of stuff in your, in your, in your project that sounds really great. So. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, 
I totally agree. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can take this. I mean, both taking it, thinking it's worthwhile and positive, and also maybe thinking it's totally wrong and wanting to go against it. I think it opens up a lot. Um, and I agree. I think there is an ethical dimension to it. I mean, that's it, this, the, what Socrates says about writing is the same thing people are saying about the internet and Wikipedia and things like this. Right? Nobody's going to remember anything. Everyone's just going to use their phones in their pocket, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of, a lot of dimensions there. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I want to sort of circle back to this comment, and you said that you wanted to separate value from talking about a history um, where speech comes first and then writing emerges. But and, and so this is just sort of a, it, it, it's not it's not to say that that theory is absolutely right in the mythology, but it's more or less that, that this is the point I think we're all. <laughs> Okay, but so the construction of the history out of which uh, writing emerges from speech presupposes uh, a value and presupposes a it presupposes a metaphysical presupposition and, uh, and it gives axiological priority insofar as the possibility of constructing that history again is a metaphysical presupposition. So I'm just wondering what you think. Of, about that whole, like enter, entering in that 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 into the coordinates of the day. Derrida on alphabetology, <laughs> yes. specifically. I don't. That, so first of all, I guess I don't know what I'm pre what you're telling me. I'm presupposing. I'm not denying that I'm presupposing it, you but I don't know what you it can't. Is. You can't. You can't say that when, when you construct a, a history and you construct a history in a specific way out of which you have speech, then writing emerges. That that presupposes as uh, uh, that privileges. Um, Speech over writing. I mean, what Derrida says basically. Why? Is like, why? Yeah. Why does that privilege speak? Because it's because like such thing. Because when you said speech comes before writing, mm -hmm. that's the presupposition. Yeah. Because the everything that characterizes write, writing, differential relations, some reliance on the structure, some reliance on dispersal, characterizes speech in the first place. So I think the presupposition is when you say, "Oh, speech comes before writing," you, you could say, "I oh, don't." No, I don't value speech more than writing. That's not the problem. The problem is that you have this thing called speech, which is not present at hand, right? right? That has more proximity. Right? And the whole challenge of, de of deconstruction is to say there's it's there's not more proximity, right? In order to speak to speak to you now, there has to be some differential system. Yes. Yeah that's archaic writing, that's already inscriptive, that's already differential, that's no longer uh, Suhandan writing, it's already present at hand. And so I, the one thing I will say is I need to do a lot more work with Derrida on that sort of I well, think, this is a project, and, and Bernard Stiegler yeah. and the, the, a lot of stuff in the philosophy of technology right now. Yeah. But part of what I want to do without having the resources to tell you why and how I think this is right, I, I don't agree with that. I don't, I mean, I think it's just simply a fact that people talk before people were able to write. And I think the fact that that emerges as something in the world that's different from just people talking has a profound impact. And I could be totally wrong as to what that profound impact but Steve, is. But Stephen agrees with you, Dan. Yeah. Right, so that, that's the problem that you don't just have verity, you have someone like Stephen who says, okay, but it does emerge as a fact, but what's the condition for the possibility of the fact? Mm -hmm. And there's something like, and it's visual, it's cave paintings, it's dreams. It's graphism. It's graphism. In general, and Stiegler has a different way of treating graphism than Derrida does, to some extent. Can just and because I don't want I don't want, I don't want one person to end up with fifteen minutes and the other people have ended up with five. Can we have a question for one of our other three no, panelists? <laughs> so I was thinking, thinking about you use the three different instances with your into your human relationship, I would say. The, the one would be the car, and then the second one is the gun, the hunting, and the third one is, is the factories. And I was kind of curious, like, wondering about deer, deer experience, um, <laughs> and how they would differ between the car and the hunting. Um, it's kind of this way that maybe, where you're making a, a clear distinction between the two of them, I wonder how they would be like in deer phenomenology or something, <laughs> um, and if that distinction can hold. Um, yeah, so then this is all like an imaginative enterprise. It's totally like yeah. Tim Timothy Morton writing talks about the 
ambient rhetoric of us trying to think ourselves as others, nature, and he says, oh, that's just a bunch of you need another real life, right? But I'm going to do it anyway and say that. <laughs> but I think you, you can imagine, in a way, the life of the deer and the different things that encroach upon their experience and like the changing of the land into, in Indiana, which is where I'm talking from, is agricultural, sort of like you drain all the marshes, you cut down the forest, you make a bunch of cornfields. Corn feeds deer very well, they get huge, you get like overpopulations, and then people travel to their jobs or whatever. So you have highways and interstates. So like the topography has changed into this different kind of hazard as the hunter deer um, on North America, the you know, indigenous people were maintaining the forest, clearing out underbrush to increase the deer populations for hunting for thousands of years. So there's a, and this is a Virilio thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's a speed of technology that is different. And as far as like if they experience that differently or they experience the hazards of the world differently, at least they have like a whole sensory apparatus of avoiding predators that maybe is a more engaged and I'm trying not to say natural, but like a more deer like experience of danger. Yeah. And okay, so then the crazy part. Can you value that kind of something that's trying to kill me compared to this other something that's trying to kill me? And that's it's into other other issues. Um, there's a really good argument I forget the author, unfortunately, about the something about the goodness of possibly being eaten by a bear, and it talks about what we lose out on going out into natural places and having no predators, and that there is there is a goodness to something about our again nature of being a possible prey and a possible predator at the same time that is a different experience than being a possible roadkill. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Imagine deer, maybe. Yeah, it's, in it's interesting. Like, and I, I realize I'm asking the question. It's like, a, like a wild question, right? But like, when I'm thinking about the, the person hitting the um, deer, mm -hmm. I'm picturing in a different place than me, which is interesting. Um, it's not Indiana. It's like you know, like where I grew up in like upstate New York. Mm -hmm. So I'm like wondering how that is different than hunting a deer. You know, like here's the deer just like kind of going where it's going, doing its thing, <laughs> it. and it's like hit by a car, and here's the deer going where it's going and shot by. Hunter. Don't you think that deer that live around there, though, are like a bit aware of that there's a road there? I don't know. I mean, it seems okay. like. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> they're pretty. They're pretty rural road. They're like pretty rural road. It's, it's probably you know, takes longer to adapt again to the, the speed of the modern right to mm -hmm. highways than to deer can still avoid hunters pretty well, yeah. especially in upstate New York where you have rolling hills and forests and you get fairly close compared to Wyoming where you can shoot a deer from a 500 yard or high prop rifle. That's probably more like a highway accident yeah. than in New York where you're actually having the apparatus of the deer to try to avoid the predator. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, the, this whole conversation, you know, we're trying to very bizarre conversation. We're from the mind of the deer. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Right, can I get another round of applause? For Uh, so we're going to take 15 minutes, uh, and then we will have our last plenary. <laughs>